But we can go ahead this morning and we can turn over, if you would, to the book of Acts. And we're in chapter 14 today. And uh, the gospel uh, at Lystra. We're looking at the gospel going on now, moving forward uh, to uh, the city of Lystra. And we're going to be looking at verses 8 through 20. There's some events that occur here, incidents in, at Lystra, which we'll note here in a moment. But at Lystra, a man was sitting who had no strength in his feet, lame from his mother's womb, who had never walked. This man was listening to Paul as he spoke, who when he had fixed his gaze on him and had seen that he had faith to be made well, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he leaped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they raised their voice saying in the Lyconian language, the gods have become like men and have come down to us. And they began calling Barnabas Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their robes and rushed out into the crowd, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of the same nature as you, and preach the gospel to you that you should turn from these vain things to a living God, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In the generations gone by, he permitted all the nations to go their own ways. And yet he did not leave himself without witness. And that he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even saying these things with difficulty, they restrained the crowds from offering sacrifice to them. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having won over the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. But while the disciples stood around him, he got up and entered the city. The next day he went away with Barnabas to Derbe. Wow. Following the ordeals at Pisidian Antioch, what the ordeal being Jewish initiated persecution on that at that city, and then moving on to Iconium where they faced Jewish initiated uh, persecution again. Paul and Barnabas they flee or fled to the cities of Lyconia. Yet they get there, and as they get there, there we find, and we're starting to see as this this. Uh, record that Luke writes, uh, we're starting to see how the Jews are becoming more and more settled in their blatant rejection of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're, they're, it, we're seeing it more and more. It's starting to become uh, the norm. And we're starting to see how it is that God is turning away from the Jews based on where they're at in their rejection. And He's reaching out to the Gentiles. Remember, Paul and Barnabas weren't quitting. When they left the last front, they weren't really uh, running, if you will, because they were really moving on. They had discerned it's time to get out of here. Yeah, was their life in danger? It was. They were being threatened. They were being mistreated. It was time to go. They discerned that and they moved on. And we see that in verses 6 and 7. They became aware of what was uh, about to happen. They fled to the cities of Lyconia, Lystra, and Derby and the surrounding region. But here's the kicker, the best part of it. And there they continued to preach the gospel. They continued. They may have been pushed out. They may have been run out. But they fled in a direction where there was more work to do. They didn't go back home. They went forward. And they took the message of, of Jesus Christ to the next cities. And they boldly proclaimed the gospel. So they're still preaching. They're not hiding. And this morning we're seeing uh, courage 
on a level that really counts for something uh, in, in, in Paul and Barnabas. They enter Lystra with trouble at their heels, nipping at their heels. Basically, that's how they come into the next city. And we're going to look at, as we unfold this account, we're going to look at three incidents that Luke records on this visit to Lister. There's three things that happen in this city. The first we're going to note is the healing of the impotent or lame man in verses 8 through 10. Then we're going to look at their nearly made gods. They, they nearly ascend to godhood in verses 11 through 18. And then we see the stoning of Paul. Three different incidents that occur. They're all related because they're all tied to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what this is all about. Uh, let's, let's understand that. This opposition isn't because of Paul's personality or Barnabas. It's because of the gospel. It's because of Jesus and their faithfulness and their love for him and their commitment to proclaim the gospel as the one way that people have to believe if they're going to get saved. That's what they're preaching. And they're preaching that they have been in synagogues. They're going where the word, where the truth of God is already present in the law and the prophets. And they're telling them, this is where the law, this is where the prophets lead to the person of Jesus Christ whom we crucified. That one we crucified rose the third day. And if you believe in him, you can have forgiveness of sins. There's where salvation is. There's where the deliverer is. It's this person. And that's what they're taking. They're taking the gospel out here and it's coming up against opposition. As they're there and they're preaching, verses 8 through 10, we see now the first incident is the healing of this lame man. It states, in Iconium, excuse me, back in, uh, let me get to the right verse. At Lystra, at Lystra, a man was sitting who had no strength in his feet, lame from his mother's womb who had never walked. This man was listening to Paul as he spoke, who when he had fixed his gaze on him and had seen that he had faith to be made well, said with a loud voice, stand upright on your feet, and he leaped up and began to walk. Now this is really, really a neat thing that happens here. Because we're told something. They come in here to Lystra, and Paul starts preaching. They don't have the New Testament. It's not pen. Paul hasn't written the New Testament. The way they authenticate, the way God authenticates the message through of the apostles is by signs and wonders. That's what he does. Uh, the signifying gifts that, uh, that, that speak as to the reality that these are God sent messengers. They're his apostles and that, that validates their message. So he's preaching the gospel. And as he's preaching, Paul looks over... And he sees this lame man. And it says he fixed his gaze on him. We've already seen that he's done that before. He locked on him. And he saw in him by his attentiveness to the message and how he was hearing the word. He was able to discern that this man had the spark of faith. He had the belief in him. And so he looks at him, and Luke tells us what this man, who he was, and what his condition was. He was a helpless man. And he emphasizes how helpless he is, because he tells us he's crippled in his feet. Then he tells us he's lame from the womb. And then he tells us he's never walked. What's he saying? He could have said it with one phrase, but he says it three different ways. Because he's Dr. Luke. And he's emphasizing that this man was a mess physically. He was a person who's never walked a day in his life, a step in his life. Never. He's been lame from birth. He's crippled in his feet. His ailment is in his feet. He cannot walk, never has, and has really no hope of walking. But Paul, preaching the gospel, looks down and sees him listening. Sees faith in this man. That's what we're told here. That he, he, having had seen that he had faith to be made well. So as they're, they're, they're preaching, this lame man is here. And Paul looks at him, fixes his gaze on him. He sees in him that faith that's there. And by the way, faith to be made well, what is that? 
Faith in faith to be made well? See, a lot of people say that's how you get well. A lot of people have made faith almost an idol. But faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. But the Word of God speaks of what? The person of God. And the faith is the, uh, your faith and my faith is only as good as the object in which it's placed. And there's only one person that, that's worthy of, our, our, of faith, and that's Jesus. So his faith, he's listening to the message. What's Paul talking about? He's not talking about faith. He's talking about faith in Jesus Christ, who's the Son of God. And he may be even telling him that he healed multitudes. He cast out demons. He, 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 he's done wonders. And, and all the things that he... We don't know what he's telling them. He's giving them the gospel. We, we're going to find out how he's doing that in a moment. Because it's interesting. Because notice what's not mentioned at the very outset here. We don't have a synagogue. This is the first time we've entered a city that he, they're not at the synagogue. That's their strategy. So some, for some reason or another, there's no synagogue. Yet there's Jewish populace, but they don't have a church here yet. And we're going to find that his approach to the gospel is even different with these folks. He comes at it differently. But anyway, he seizes the moment, Paul does, and he tells this man to stand up on your feet. And he leaps up. Doesn't grab hold of the wall and pull himself up and wobble and stumble and almost fall down and shakes off the, 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 the ailment. No, it says he leaps up and he starts jumping around here and he's walking. He's healed. He is totally healed. This is amazing uh, for what it is in this incident. This is the third time, by the way, we've had a lame man healed in this record so far. That, that have actually been identified. There may have been more. Obviously, there's places where signs and wonders are done, and we're not told exactly what all those were. So there, it could have been many. But there's three that have been mentioned w with the inclusion of this one. I want to say this about this. Peter did the other two, and, Luke, and uh, Paul does this one. And what we find is it establishes Paul on a level with Peter. He's an apostle. Just the same, born out of due season, with all of what, he, what, what Paul bore in his own heart with his guilt of being the chiefest of sinners, the one who was out persecuting the church. We know what Paul had to deal with inside, that, that, what that felt like. But he's, he is an apostle. He is an apostle, just the same as Peter. And I'm going to tell you, this healing of the lame man, it got the attention of everybody. That witnessed it. Because he's lame from, from where? From the birth. He's never walked. I mean, they know this guy. We would know him in this community. We would know, probably know him in a, uh, if, if we, in Pekin even. I mean, if we, we go, you go to Pekin and there's, I don't know how many, 35,000, 30,000 in Pekin. But if you're up there uh, once a month even, you may, rec you may see a guy like that. And if you heard that he's healed, he's w jumped up and started walking. <laughs> You take note of that. And that's exactly what happened. But they go in the opposite direction of where Paul wants them to go. They bite down on the bit and they go the opposite way. They go the opposite way and that's the second incident. They're nearly promoted to godhood, to deity level. In the eyes of those who witness this miracle. Look at 11 through 18 again. When the crowd saw... What Paul had done. Now look at that, what it said here. And Luke's writing this. When the crowd saw what Paul had done. Who really did it? Paul did it. But he did it only by the power of, of, of God. Of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. And they raised their voice when they witnessed this. They saw that Paul had done this. And they raised their voice saying in the Lyconian language. Now... I, that's important that we understand what, what they say here. Uh, why he says that. Because why does he say, the, saying it in the Laconian language, the gods have become like men and have come down to us. And they began calling Barnabas Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus 
who runs the local temple there, was just outside the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. They, they even get the, the priest leadership of these temples to come in and participate based on the level of this miracle that has occurred. But when, but when, but when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of it, they tore their robes and rushed out into the crowd crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of the same nature as you and preach the gospel to you that you should turn from these vain things to the living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In the generation gone by, he permitted all nations to go their own ways. And yet he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness, even saying these things... With difficulty, they restrained the crowds from offering sacrifice to them. They are in a frenzy over this miracle. They, they come in and they're going to take Paul and Barnabas and elevate them to a, a, a godhood state. And they're going to actually not only laud them, but they're going to sacrifice to them. It's interesting, it's, it's possible... We don't know the, the, the total, uh, how this played out. But the fact that Luke mentions they, they said it in the Lyconian language, it's very possible that, that Paul and Barnabas really don't understand what's going down just let, yet. Because you could have people worked up in a frenzy just over a lame man who's been lame from birth, who's up jumping around walking and everything else. They, I mean, that's exciting in and of itself. And so they may not have sorted out just immediately what's going on. But when they do, they realize that this has to be stopped. They're not going to accept this. And probably good because we already know what happened to uh, Herod when he took the glory from God and he, st he, he, he uh, stole the glory from God. He was eaten by worms. But they called Paul Hermes. They called Barnabas Zeus. They get ready. They make preparations to sacrifice to them. And then their response in 14 and 17 is they refuse it. They tear their clothing. A sign of great grief over what's taking place. They rip their clothing and say, this can't happen. This can't go on. You can't do this. And then they state why it is. Because they are just men the same. They refused it. They rejected that worship. But I want to look uh, at the method here. Look at the method that they preached the gospel here. We've already noted we're not in the synagogue. So we're not using the law and the prophets. They're ready to make them a deity. A God. And he says we're preaching a gospel with the intent of turning you from these very things. These vain things. And what, did they, what does he use to share the gospel with them? With a person who's not heard the law or the prophets. Where do you go? Romans chapter 1. The invisible things of God are clearly seen. by From what? The creation. That which has been made even as eternal power and God. And Paul, you, he immediately in these circumstances. It's It's amazing. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I mean, he's the Apostle Paul. What do you think? I mean, you, you, it should happen this way. But it's amazing that he understands that these people aren't the people in the synagogue. This is a totally different situation here. And the gospel has to come from a different place. I can't go to the law and the prophets just yet. I have to come from something that is the experience of every heathen. And what he says is that there is a living God. And He's the one who's been blessing you by His grace, although He let all the Gentiles go their own way, even though they went their own way, He witnessed to you. He made you aware that, the, that I'm here. I'm God. He brought rain and sunshine and harvest 
and, and bless them with this. And so he meets them with creation. Go to Romans real quick, because Paul talks about this. In Romans chapter 1. Some of you have committed these verses, I know, to memory. In verses 19 and 20. Actually, uh, 18. Let's go ahead with 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Get that. People suppress the truth. What people are we talking about? We're talking about the, even the pagans. And he goes on, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. So what he's saying is, I'm giving you Jesus so you'll quit the nonsense with the idols. And the one I'm talking about is the living God. There is a living God. And he's been ministering to you his truth through, through the creation. Through, the, through what he's blessed you with, with the rains and the harvest and all of that. He's made himself known. And this Roman passage tells us, and this is where I've always said uh, to you, look at what it says in 19, because that which is known about God is evident where? Within them. See, every person, every person, and I, I'm getting in a theological vein here, but every person has an intuitive knowledge of the existence of God. That's why I tell you there's no true atheists out there. In the sense of they have an un, uh, they have a, a belief of no God in, in innocence. And what I mean by that is, is that it's pure. There's no, that what they've done is they've suppressed what he's told everyone. And he's told everyone by creation that I'm here. That I am God. And uh, so he's left them without excuse. And Paul, here in Lystra, he goes right there. And he witnesses that way. I love it. Because you come over to Romans and you're, you're like, this is what Paul tells us we need to do when we're up against people who've never heard the gospel. You've got to come from creation. You've got to use uh, intricate design, co a cosmological argument, teleological argument, the fact that there's a creation. Because God put it in everybody. And, and they could say, I don't believe it. I believe in evolution. No, you've made evolution your God, but at the suppression of the truth that God, that there is a God who created all this. It's in them. <laughs> and, and, and what you'll find is, is really, it, once they're saved, they'll admit that. <laughs> Most people will admit that they had that, that there's, it's there. It's, it's, in, it's in them. He puts it within every man. But let's go on here. Let's, let's continue on. He stressed the evidence. He moves on here. And then look at verse 18 here uh, of, our, of our record. Even saying these things with difficulty, they restrained the crowds from offering sacrifice to them. They were bent on making them deities. They wanted this to happen, and they literally had to restrain, had to restrain the crowds from going forward with this. They're restraining them from doing this. Look at the third incident. Because this is a mind blower. Because we're going from being made gods to being stoned to death. That's, a, that's crazy. Look at this, 19 and 20. But this, this, we see this go on in the world though. But look at what, what happens. But Jews came from Antioch. Here they are. And we find these guys. Antioch and Iconium, the two cities that we came up against opposition from the Jewish community, and having won over the crowds, they swayed the crowds, they stoned Paul. Why did they pick Paul? Because he was the one who spoke the message. He's the main speaker. He's the one propagating this. And they dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. Okay? So they go from wanting to make them gods where Paul and Barnabas have to literally restrain them from doing that to a day later, they take them, stone Paul, and drag him out of the city and leave him for dead. Fickle? <laughs> Beyond fickle, 
This is, this is, this is the nature of, uh, of man. When we don't get what we want, we lash out on those who oppose our, our, what we want. They wanted another idol. They wanted, de- they wanted to deify Paul and Barnabas. They, they felt like this, they're going to make them gods. And when, they didn't let, when that didn't get to happen, they, 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 their, their actions changed. But it's extreme. They went to the, the extreme the other way. One, and I don't know who, who I'm quoting here because I, I don't have this. But it, 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 he said it this way. Disillusioned fanatics are easily led off into contradictory actions. If they don't get what they want, they'll lash out the opposite way and almost in hypocrisy of where they were in, the, in their initial reaction. And you see it all the time. It, it, it's, it's the nature of people. But anyhow, they stoned him. They dragged him out of the, of the city. Now here, here's the issue. They assumed he was dead. If you look at the verse there, they stoned him, dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. Now here's the debate. Was he dead or was he not dead? Luke seems to indicate that they supposed him to be dead. But if you go over to 2 Corinthians, depending on who you have in view there, in 2 Corinthians 12 and verses 2 through 4, I'll just flip over there. Let's go over there and read it real quick. Because this is Paul writing in 2 Corinthians, and he talks about this over here. Chapter 12. You can never get there. I need to do some more sword drills here. 12, 2, and 4. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or out of the body I do not know, God knows. Such a man was caught up to the third heaven. And I know how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak. And then down in 7, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh uh, to keep him humble. Now here's the thing. Who was this man? It was Paul. When did this happen? It's this stoning, it, it's believed that he actually, whether briefly or whatever, he, they didn't, weren't just supposing him dead. That's what they thought. He probably was dead. And God raised him to life. If not, God took him in that moment and allowed him to come in in, in, in this, this time frame. And, and it's believed that that's when he had that experience he records over in 2 uh, Corinthians. So... It's an amazing thing that goes on here. And I'm going to say another thing that just is a mind blower here. Who was that Stephen stoning? Paul was. Very likely one of the chief culprits there. Because he ends up being the poster boy, remember, for the persecution and the, the, and the actual pursuit of all the believers. He was the one holding coats while other people stoned Stephen to death. He hurt Stephen. And here he is now doing what? Preaching the exact same message. And God in His sovereignty lets him experience what happened to Stephen. Is that not wild? One of the commentators said he reaped what he sowed. He he was a big part of the stoning over here with his hostility and he was all for it. And in his life experience, God allowed him to experience what Stephen went through. That's powerful. That's really powerful. And it's not like God's judging him. I mean, he, 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 there's consequences for all of our, you know, sin. I mean, they can come back on us even after we're saved. Because you could argue, well, he's saved now. Well, sure he is. That's why God raised him up again. <laughs> and he's going to continue to use him. But the reality is, is he experienced uh, the stoning un, uh, unto death. Whether you want to take him as dead or not, I don't know. I, I mean, we'll, we're, we can ask him when we get there. Were you dead? <laughs> were, you, were you dead or what actually went down? And he'll, he'll be able to tell us at that point. But it was a, a tremendous miracle. Because look, look what happens here after the stoning. They stoned him. They dragged him out of the city. So they stoned him. He's unconscious. Dead. Believed to be dead. They drag him out as refuse. 
as a, just a, 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 a carcass to be disposed of. They dragged him out of their city. But while the disciples stood around him, he got up and entered the city. He entered the city and then the next day he went away with Barnabas into, into uh, or to Derby. Now, the miracle is they stone him. And even if he wasn't dead, to recover enough from a stoning to get up off the ground yourself and then to have the boldness and the courage in the Lord to walk right back into the same city that had drug you, stoned you and drug you out, that's all God. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, that's all God and commitment to the Lord. But it's interesting here because he gets up and he, and he walks back in here. He, he wasn't going to do more work, so what was he doing? And, and I, you know, I, it's just speculation on my part because it doesn't really say, but what it says to me is it's not over till God says it's over. And even if I don't witness to one more person, you don't put me out until God tells me it's time for me to go out. And, and he's been able to discern that. Here he actually went through the stoning. He experienced the stoning. And yet he gets up and he goes back in. So you want to talk about courage? That's courage. That's real courage. And he went back in there, and then the next day he gets up, and what's he do? He goes to the next city. He moves on with the gospel. Now I've got to ask you this in close, wrapping this up. Was this a wasted trip? You know, was it wasted here in Lystra? Was this a wasted trip? I'm going to tell you something. It definitely wasn't because you you, you got to see what verse 20 said. What did it say? It says, but while the what? Disciples. But while the disciples stood around him, he got up. Not the ones who just stoned him. It's the disciples who are still standing around him as he's laying there, uh, uh, whether dead or whatever, whatever state he's in. There's believers in Lystra because of Paul and Barnabas. There's believers, people born again. Was it a wasted trip? No. And I'm going to tell you another thing. You can go look it up. I'm not going to make you go there today, but you can go on to 16.1. And well, we can go here, but it goes back over to Timothy. I wasn't going to go there, but go to 16.1 in Acts and just look at something. Paul came also, this is on his second missionary trip. Paul came also to Derby and to Lystra. And a disciple was there named Timothy. And what we find over in, in uh, the record of the book of Timothy, there's also Eunice and Lois. Grandma and, gra uh, and mom. They were, they were already Jewish believers. I believe they came to Christ probably on the first missionary journey with Timothy. And they were all fruit from this episode. So was it a wasted trip? Absolutely not. It's never wasted. Even if they reject it, they've, they've been confronted with the truth of the gospel. But God did some great things here. Just a couple of points in closing. Listen, the Lord's not going to lead us where He can't keep us. If God wants us there, He'll keep us there. And I don't mean keep us in, in the actual uh, proximity of where He put us, but He's able to keep us. Keep us in that moment. Even though he was stoned, he's still the Lord's in control. They don't, they don't take him out of the equation until God takes him out of the equation. It's God who, who decides when it's time for Paul to come home, not them. And so God can, can keep us. And, and I'm going to tell you this. There shouldn't be any quit in, in a believer. What we're seeing from the apostles, one of the things, the legacies they leave us, is that there shouldn't really be any quit in us. Because we have the gospel... We have the message that saves eternally those who will believe in Jesus. There should be no quit in us. Paul got up, he went right back into the city. And then he goes on again, he's going to press on with the gospel. We need to have that same kind of courage. A courage that really counts for the work of the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord, we want to thank you uh, again just for what we glean here in these uh, historical records uh, as are recorded here in the book of Acts as Luke records them. I pray, Lord, that we could uh, capture some of that spirit, that courage uh, that undergirded uh, and, and caused these men to be who they were uh, for the gospel. Lord, uh, we're part of something wonderful, and I pray that we would really grasp that that uh, being a part of the building of your church and the sharing of the saving message of Christ 
is, is a, a priority, should be the priority of our lives. And we need to embrace that with, with a boldness uh, from your spirit, Lord. But I just thank you for what we're learning. I pray you continue to bless our study as we move forward in the days to come. I thank you for this morning, Lord, and, and uh, the dedication as well of uh, Daniel. And, and I just uh, praise you for Ian and Sonia and their heart for you again, Lord. And I ask now as uh, we leave this place this morning, I pray you bless our fellowship with one another that we will enjoy this day. And then also our club ministries tonight, may they be blessed of you that we might be used to impact lives, these young lives, for your glory. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.